All right. Uh, there's two more folks in the meeting, uh, waiting room. Yep, got them. Thank you. All right, I'm going to launch just because we promised that we will do this in a timely fashion and get people uh, in and out. Um, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the forum on community connectivity, livability, and economic vitality. My name is Jim Tassie. I am the assistant director of the Bicycle Coalition of Maine and the director for advocacy and education programming. And I will be facilitating today's session in which you will hear from three experts about why walking and bicycling are important to the livability, health, and economic prosperity of Maine. For those who don't know anything about the Bicycle Coalition of Maine, let me just briefly say that we are the state's education, advocacy, and encouragement organization. We uh, work with the legislature uh, in, in events like this and, and other forms. Um, we uh, administer the statewide bicycle and pedestrian safety education program on behalf of the DOT and other entities. And we provide encouragement in the form of events and um, other uh, uh, gestures and, and initiatives. You can learn more about the coalition at www.bikemain.org. We're very happy to be joined by the following legislator, legislators today, uh, including uh, Arthur Bell, Ben Chipman, Sophia Warren, Poppy Arford, Patty Hymanson, Steve Moriarty, Christina West, Melanie Sachs, and Ann Carney. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy days to join us. Um, we have um, uh, you know, over, over 30 uh, participants from the public. Um, so um, thank you as well for joining us. The purpose of today's meeting is to establish a sense of urgency around um, bicycle, pedestrian, livability, walkability, and um, uh, community connectedness issues. Um, this is the first forum in a series of meetings devoted to understanding the importance of designing communities in Maine that support walking and bicycling for health, transportation, and economic growth. Subsequent meetings uh, will be dedicated to providing research and guidance on legislation and policies that impact these issues. Our hope is that we're gonna convene a group of legislators today that are gonna be interested in these issues and will be um, uh, you know, receptive to updates about uh, legislation that we're monitoring that uh, impacts walkability, bikeability, and livability issues in Maine. Um, and far from being incidental or purely recreational aspects of a community, the walkability and bikeability of a place are really critical to its identity and vibrancy. The ability to walk or bike safely and conveniently is a significant factor in gauging the overall appeal and vitality of a community. Active transportation exists at the nexus of a variety of social issues, including health, transportation, economic growth, environmental concerns, social equity, and, and others. Today's session is going to explore how communities that are connected at the basic level of walkability and bikeability, whether on streets, sidewalks, or multi-use trails, permit opportunities for people to age in place be, and, and be healthy. Our experts will discuss the place of what is known as active transportation in supporting aging Mainers, public health, and vibrant community planning. Uh, with no further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, uh, who is Dr. Rebecca Bolus, the Executive Director of the Maine Public Health Association. Um, she's a leading voice in Maine on the impacts of active transportation on public health. In addition to her work with the Maine Public Health Association, Becca is an adjunct faculty member at Tufts University's Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy, where she co-teaches a course about designing active communities with Mark Fenton, an internationally recognized advocate for walkable, livable communities. Welcome, Becca. It's great to have you here. Can you tell us a little bit about why you think walkable and bikeable communities are so important to Maine? Thanks, Jim. I'm really happy to be here and to be part of this conversation. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am just really excited to be here. So uh, I'm going to try to distill decades of research and an entire course that I teach into just five minutes. Uh, so next slide, please. I'm going to go really fast. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So one of the things we know is that we have a physical inactivity problem, both in Maine and the U.S., with about 23 percent of Maine adults reporting being physically inactive. And then in the US, it's about 26%. And what we see is that those levels vary 
uh, by race, ethnicity, by income, and by location. And research also shows that sedentary time is, is in fact its own risk factor for poor health, independent of being physically active. And the poor health outcomes include increased risk for cancer, for type 2 diabetes, for anxiety, and, and other mental health disorders, including depression, cardiovascular disease, and obesity. Next slide, please. So to increase physical activity, we need to start paying attention to our communities uh, and to assessing and improving environmental factors, um, including thinking about what are determinants of inactivity, such as urbanization patterns, technological changes, and um, those same factors, very interestingly, are also factors that can lead to increased activity, including looking at land, mixed land use, connectivity, uh, and overall neighborhood design. So for those of you that have been to Southwest Harbor, which are two images that you see on the slide right now, these are photos from the same street, just at different ends. Um, and so putting those principles I was talking about before into practice, you'll notice that there are trees. Uh, it's a desirable place to walk. There are sidewalks. In the top left photo, there are awnings over a bench. So if someone gets tired, it's a hot day, there's a place for them to sit. Um, there are stores, like there are places for them to want to go. So this is a commercial street. There are businesses, but it's one that you would probably enjoy going for a walk down. Next slide, please. This is contrasted with another place that many of you may recognize, which is Route 1 down in Bitterford. Uh, and this is also a, a commercial zone, but very different. Um, and so while there is a sidewalk, which is great, and there is a, a crosswalk, slightly poorly paint, painted, but it is there, and there's a median in the middle, uh, in case you're trying to run across the four lanes of traffic, there's a place for you to stop. But the only places really for you to go are a bunch of fast food places, which in public health we call a, a food swamp. Uh, there aren't, there's not a really a mixed use here. It's not really a desirable place that you might want to go for a walk. Um, you know, you got fast traffic going, there's not much of a buffer space. So again, some of these design elements that uh, are impacting the likelihood that people want to be walkable and visit these different locations. Next slide, please. So I, I just want to clarify that having a busy road like that does not mean that you can't implement design features that encourage walkability. The, this photo and the next one on the next slide, don't, don't get to quite yet though, uh, are from Salt Lake City, Utah. And what you'll notice here are, you know, wide crosswalks, wide sidewalks. There's a bike lane um, on the other side of the street. There's bike parking. Um, and if you go to the next slide now, you'll see the same thing here. There's a dedicated bike lane. Again, there's a lot of traffic. I'm not, I'm not trying to suggest you can only have a walkable community in downtown communities like, um, or a, a walkable community in, in areas like Southwest Harbor, you can have them in bigger commercial zones, but you have to invest in those, those features. Next slide, please. So data show that our zip code is a stronger predictor of our health status than our genetic code. And so what that means for walkability is that people with lower incomes are more than 20% as likely to report heavy traffic. So thinking about that, that Bitterford photo, uh, which can be a deterrent for walkability. And we see similar differences uh, for communities that may have unattended dogs. So that can you know, influence perceived and even actual safety for air quality because of the, the traffic and because of different industries that are close by. And all of those together are going to impact walkability. Uh, we have seen in research that individuals living in unwalkable neighborhoods are less physically active and more likely to develop some of those chronic diseases that I mentioned at the beginning, including obesity and type 2 diabetes. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. And I just want to end with talking about the business argument for walkability. So research has consistently shown that walkable communities mean not only improving public health and health equity, but they also can improve the return on investment. You can see that um, Investing in walkability uh, is, is more economically productive than other types of development that we see increases in walk score can increase home values. And the way that it works is that the cost of paving sidewalks, just as an example, is like nothing compared to the cost of paving roads or installing traffic signals and paying salaries of um, you know, officers to monitor parking meters, you know, all sorts of different investments that are, are ongoing when we're creating car-centric communities as opposed to bike-centric communities. Next slide, please. And just to give you uh, a quick example of really how um, walkable communities really do contribute to public health, 
Um, you can see again, the raise in, in property values. Uh, we know that bike ped and, and transit travelers spend more per month when they're out in the community. Uh, and then that high uh, ROI on, on public investment like I was just talking about. Next slide, please. So the last thing I just wanna go through here is just an example of really two different areas, sort of the contrast I showed at the beginning. But in the photo on the left, you'll see that on just one block of this town, there are a dozen businesses and most of which on the top of the business, you'll see an apartment or an office. So there's the mixed use design, there's uh, different destinations. Most of these buildings, as you can see here, are older. So that means that the investments they made in the mixed use even a century ago really are still paying, paying dividends now. And then the photo on the bottom right, it's more of a car centric design, which while it has a sidewalk and some, some sparse trees, there's only one business, you know, it's a, it's a Perkins restaurant. Most of the space is used up for parking. So there's really only one place to go. And it, because it's not very walkable, you would, you would be driving and just spending your time at that one business instead of spending your money at all these different businesses. So the last slide I have for my very quick time uh, was just to share a couple of tools that folks may be interested in. The World Health Organization has developed something that's called the HEAT tool, the Health Economic Assessment Tool, which allows you to look at the ROI for different investments in, in walkable communities. And then I had mentioned Walk Score in an earlier slide, and this link right here will give you more information about that. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Bolas. That was great. And um, you know, I'm going to just add, um, you know, the 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 chronic diseases that you mentioned in your presentation are also quite expensive for us as a culture and society. And um, uh, I, I think that, you know, that that can't be um, over uh, emphasized. I mean, this, these investments in walkability and bikeability by combating chronic disease save us all money in the long run. Great. Thanks, Jim. Great. Um, and uh, I, let me add at this time too, that uh, we, we will be transitioning to a question and answer period uh, after all our speakers have, have had a chance to talk. So if you've got questions or wanna make comments, uh, we'll be able to do that in the uh, um, later parts of the, uh, of the uh, forum today. Our next speaker is Dr. Lori Parham, the main state director for AARP. Uh, and Lori K. Parham, PhD, is AARP Maine State Director, leading the state's advocacy and education efforts on health, financial security, and livable community issues statewide. Lori has extensive knowledge of health and long-term care issues growing out of her work as a legislative analyst for the Florida Senate, providing technical expertise to the Committee on Health, Aging, and Long-Term Care prior to her employment with AARP. Lori also oversees AARP's Maine's efforts to engage cities and towns in creating livable communities for people of all ages with a specific focus on economic development and aging in place. She has presented to multiple groups on the importance of Maine taking a collaborative and proactive approach to building age-friendly communities. We are very happy to welcome Lori Parham to today's forum. Dr. Parham, same question for you. Why do you think walkable and bikeable communities are so important for Maine? Ah, the number one rule, unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, Jim. And it's great to be with everyone today. It's great to see how many folks are interested in these important issues. Uh, so for those of you who may not know, AARP Maine is a nonprofit, nonpartisan social mission organization. Uh, we have uh, just around 200,000 members, 50 and older across the state of Maine. And uh, we work to ensure that uh, Mainers 50 and older and their families can age with dignity and purpose. Um, one of the areas of focus for AARP Maine is supporting efforts of neighborhoods, uh, cities, and towns to be great places for people of all ages to live. And so I want to be clear that while our membership is 50 and older, and often people think of AARP as a senior organization, uh, the issues we work on uh, really are multi-generational and that is really important to us. And the issues that we're talking about today are multi-generational issues uh, for Maine and, and across the country. Uh, we really believe that communities should provide safe and walkable streets, age-friendly housing and transportation options, 
uh, access to the needed services and opportunities for residents of all ages to participate and be an active participant in community life. And so as we think about a livability or a livable agenda, we're looking at all of those components. And that's why we really appreciate uh, the opportunity we've had to work um, with uh, the Bicycle Coalition on a number of projects across our communities. Uh, in Maine, 70 communities or municipalities have joined our age-friendly network. Uh, there are others who have not joined our network, but 70 have um, committed uh, to a, a process and a plan for looking at livability at the community level. And uh, we're also proud that uh, Governor Mills uh, chose uh, for, a, uh, for Maine to be an age-friendly state. In fact, we just released our age-friendly state plan um, that looks at these or provides recommendations around uh, the issues we're talking about today, walkability and bikeability. Um, so in, in our process, each community does an assessment to understand local interests and needs, and they develop a plan to address these needs. And walkability continues to be a top issue for Maine's communities. Uh, walkability and bikeability, uh, not only in downtowns, but also accessible trails, being able to get out and about uh, in a state like Maine. And we've worked in a number of communities on projects with the Bike Coalition uh, in Bangor, North Yarmouth, Old Orchard Beach, and others. So I'm just going to talk quickly because we were given just a little time about two areas um, that we work on. And the first is sidewalks. Um, we advocate for well-designed sidewalks in communities and Rebecca showed some great photos in her presentation. Um, the benefits of sidewalks, um, there are many. Um, people who live in neighborhoods with sidewalks are 47% more likely to be active at least 39 minutes a day. And I can't stress enough uh, what Rebecca uh, mentioned around the economic impacts of uh, sidewalks and walkability. So a well-constructed walkway for a typical 50 foot wide residential property might cost a builder $2,000, but it can return 15 times that investment and resale value. So it's good for people um, to have access and safe ways to walk, uh, whether you're uh, an older adult or a young mother uh, with children, but it's also good for local economies. Um, Rebecca mentioned walk score, and uh, we've also seen that with retail properties uh, with a rock, walk score ranking of 80 out of 100, they were valued 54% higher than properties with a walk score of 20 and had an increase in net operating income of 42%. You know, Maine small businesses are such an important part of the economy here. And so as we, we think about uh, public access and safe public access, this is hugely important. Uh, another area that is important to us where we've done a lot of work with um, the Bike Coalition is traffic calming. Streets and auto automobile parking now take up 25 to 50% of all public space in cities. Hmm. Uh, the, the, the data on injury is, is pretty um, stark too. Um, when vehicles moving at 20 miles an hour collide with pedestrians, fewer than 10% of those struck are killed. Most injuries are minor and 30% suffer no injuries at all. But when a vehicle is traveling at 30 miles per hour, 45% of pedestrians hit are killed and many are seriously injured. And at 40 miles an hour, more than 80% of the pedestrians involved are killed and are also severely injured. So uh, I, I love that we've been working with some of our small towns, and I'll give a shout out to North Yarmouth, to really try to slow, slow folks down, especially as they're going through communities, um, through our smaller communities. Um, our roads are especially hazardous for children and older adults. Pedestrians age 65 and older accounted for 20% of all pedestrian deaths and an estimated 10% of all pedestrian injuries uh, in 2017. And one in every five children under the age of 15 killed in traffic crash crashes were pedestrians. So again, this is a multi-generational issue that we've got to be looking at. So um, we believe that crossing the street shouldn't have to mean crossing your fingers and hoping for the best. Uh, while unsafe streets disproportionately affect older people, safe streets are really good for everyone. Um, 
you know, so we, we really believe at AARP that we need to continually continue to adopt policies that ensure our streets are safe and designed for all, whether it's pedestrians, bicyclists, motorists, and ensuring good public transit where we can. Uh, we really have to think about users of all ages. And um, I, right before I, I, I um, wrap up, I, I do want to go back to this economic impact issue. Uh, we released late last year an updated report on the impact of people over 50 on Maine's economy. Um, and as we think about our, our age-friendly work, um, this uh, the work we do is based on feedback uh, that we've gotten across the country and the World Health Organization has gotten internationally on what people over 50 value in terms of being able to, to live in their home and community as they age. And bike and pedestrian issues are front and center. The more we can do to address these kinds of policies in a positive way, the more likely we are to attract people to Maine. And what I love about this is um, uh, uh, aging boomers, their children are the millennials. And in studies, what we're finding is they want the same things. They want um, access um, to cities and towns. They want to be, them to be walkable and bikeable. So um, the latest data shows that um, Maine's 50 plus population creates outsized economic impact and will drive economic growth for Maine in the next 30 years. In 2018, the 50 plus population accounted for 43% of Maine's population, yet contributed 48% or $34 billion of the state's total GDP. Their activities supported 442,000 jobs and generated 23 billion in wages and salaries. So this is a really big deal and it's growing over time. The forecast out to 2050 show uh, an impact, a GDP impact of $102 billion. So we know this is what people want and we know it's good for the state. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Lori. And um, you know, love the points about uh, the you know the the return on investment that comes out of um, putting money into walkability and bikeability. And and it's important to really emphasize that you know this isn't just about you know being able to take a casual walk. This is actually really important to the the overall vitality and vibrancy of a community, its economic health as well as its um, personal health, which you know. Both of you spoke, uh, both you and Dr. Bola spoke on. And our final speaker, I think, is going to add um, more information on this specific topic, um, especially some of the points that you uh, raised about attracting people to Maine. Walkable and bikeable communities um, you know, are attractive to, to a new workforce in the 21st century. And speaking on that and other topics, we have Nate Rudy who is currently the city manager for Hallowell and the uh, soon to be new town manager for the town of Gray. Um, Nate is currently uh, at uh, Hallowell and he's also formerly the director of planning and development for the city of Gardner. He, and he's also worked as a regional business development specialist for the state of Maine. Nate is a student of politics, agronomy, engineering and economics who's worked in state and local government and has managed federal, state, and foundation-funded grant programs. He brings the insight of a municipal staff person who's been very, very intimate with these issues at the local level. Um, Nate, uh, same question for you. Why do you think walkable and bikeable communities are so important for the state of Maine? So thank you, Jim. Thank you for the invitation to participate in the discussion. I want to ask if the facilitator can um, bring down the slide. I only have two slides today. I want to bring that down so we can see each other in the room if that's possible. And I would like to uh, acknowledge Lori and AARP for the leadership work that they've done there. We're going to do a lot of Q&A work, I hope, after my presentation. So I'll desperately try to be brief, but I'm from the South. So, But thank you to Lori for, for AARP's work and the support that you've provided for local communities and to other organizations like Build Maine, uh, who are working in the same vein of livability and of course, Bicycle Coalition. Um, if any of you have attended any of those uh, Grow Smart Maine by uh, BCM, Build Maine uh, conferences, you may be familiar with Jeff Speck in his book, The Walkable City. And in that book, Jeff Speck writes about how we can rethink 
uh, downtowns and villages to put people at the center of the experience rather than traffic. And Jeff says that a good walk should be useful, safe, comfortable, and interesting. And I think a good bike ride, or I will submit to you, even a good commute should have similar qualities and that a good downtown or village center is one that is accessible for vehicular traffic without being dangerous or prohibitive for bike ped commuters and enthusiasts of all ages. Think about it. When our historic downtowns were built, they came up around the travel ways of their era, which is why many places like Hollowell or Gardner are built along the river and others like Gray were built along the rail line. And our local roads and streets were designed for horse-drawn carriages, but mostly for walkers. Over time, our travel has shifted to cars and trucks riding on highways and state roads. And in many places like Hollowell and Gray, those state roads bring a lot of traffic through our oldest and most historic spaces. Regardless of that traffic, our historic communities are the hubs of the main experience, part of who we are as a state and part of the charm that fuels our tourism economy and part of the reason that people continue to choose to live there. But if COVID has taught us anything other than that we all need to wear a mask out of respect and concern for our friends, neighbors, coworkers, and loved ones, it has taught us that we don't all need an automobile commute to get to work every day and that our economy can survive and maybe even prosper with help from an expanded broadband network into rural Maine. Our travel ways are evolving to now include some public transportation challenges and opportunities like point to point ride services that are largely volunteer driven and desperate for state funding support. They are also evolving to include a greater awareness of bike ped safety concerns, like the ones that Lori brought up about the speed of traffic and to include a new kind of commute over broadband internet, which is immensely less expensive to build and maintain per mile than a highway system, but still gets many of us to work in meaningful ways. Rural broadband will create new spokes to con connect our community hubs in places that are eager for new economic development. So I did have one slide, if it's possible to bring that up, <laughs> that talks about the way that we travel, the way that we shop, the way that we commute, and how they've all changed in the last five years in Maine, and especially in the last year, and how we see and experience Maine's hub communities and our downtowns and villages has changed with that. This is a slide from near uh, downtown Hollowell that was produced as part of a design collaboration between Bicycle Coalition of Maine, Vision Hollowell, which is our Main Street affiliate, the Maine Downtown Center, and the Hollowell Area Board of Trade. Um, there's a bigger slide that shows you the rest of the downtown in Hollowell. And if you're looking at that slide, what you would see is how this rail, this bike crossing connects to our historic downtown, which is famously or infamously ground zero for the historic preservation movement in Maine after an attempt by the highway department to literally remove the entire line of buildings on the river side of the road to make more room for the state highway. And that proposal was met with coordinated local opposition and lobbying at the state house and is linked to the forming of the Maine Historic Preservation Commission. The road that you're seeing there is also a segment of the East Coast Greenway, a bicycle trail which runs north to south from Florida to Maine and passes up the Kennebec River Rail Trail through downtown Hollowell. You're also looking at a state road with a daily traffic count of over 15,000 cars and trucks on Water Street. And what I see when I look at this is that our Main Street is someone else's state highway and is someone else's bike trek. So there's a lot of tension in this design and BCM came to help us create this safe bicycle passage. It's like a bicycle crosswalk um, at a place that uh, is famous for uh, local people trying to cross the highway and getting one finger salutes and honking from commuters who are trying to get from uh, wherever they're coming from to wherever they're going, uh, which is not always hollow. Well. And, you know, we had some, I had some thoughts for y'all to consider, like, think about the ways that your commute has changed between last year in February, before COVID, and now. And um, how has your relationship with your car and your bicycle 
and your walking shoes changed during that last year. And if Maybe. you don't, yeah, go ahead, Jim. I can interrupt. Uh, we do have a poll that we can pop up if you Let's want to. Try. Okay. Let's do this poll. I think this will be fun. So the, uh, the, the task for all of the participants is to simply answer the question, did you drive your car less during the pandemic? Um, did the pandemic and the increase in walking or biking that you might have done um, make you more aware or uh, sensitive to deficiencies in the network? And um, how, did, how did the uh, internet um, kind of shape up for you as, as being? And can everyone see the poll and are they able to interact? Okay, I see Anne, thank you for nodding your head. <laughs> so go ahead and uh, I'm gonna give it a couple more uh, seconds here. We're doing good on time and then we'll, we'll cancel that and we'll get a chance to see what the results are. Poll is closing in one, two, three seconds and poll is closed and Let's see what the results look like. Okay. And I actually, uh, I'm not able to see that. <laughs> oh, you're the, okay. Well, so what, it's, uh, what it shows is that 89% of people said that they drove their car less during the pandemic. 73% of people said that they became more aware of the deficiencies in their walkability or bikeability of their community and 83% said that the importance of their internet connection became more so during COVID. So how about that? Fascinating. Just in a year. A year ago, nobody, most people never used Zoom before, you know. So, so things have really changed a lot for us. And I think this is a harbinger of other things to come. And that's what I want to say. If you don't need a car to get to work now, or maybe you use a car three times a week instead of five, how does that change your definition of the word transportation? How does that change your relationship and your awareness of the neighborhood that you live in? And it seems like from the polls that it does quite a bit. And how has it changed the way that you shop and access your downtown or your village center? I'm about to start working in the town of Gray and I have another slide there for that, that illustrates I think that we're in a moment where a lot of things are changing. And with thoughtful conversation and support from the legislature, frankly, Maine can embrace this moment and shape the 21st century economy for the state. It is that simple and it's that important. The, real, the infrastructure investments that we make on the state and local level in the next three years are going to determine whether or not some places in the state are successful in the next century. It is that simple and that important. So in gray, we want to reestablish a village center at the center of four state highways and roads that come in a quarter of a mile away from a, a interstate exit. And we're going to do this. There are a lot of historic buildings in this little area. There's also a lot of traffic. So we're already working with Bicycle Coalition and we're gonna keep working on this. And I'm gonna say that there are other places all around the state that are going to take on that same challenge. Today, more than ever in modern history, knowledge workers, at least, if not others, can choose to live wherever they want. This is a new economic proposition of major consequence. People are moving to Maine or moving back to Maine in record numbers. For example, one of Hollowell's two new city council members is a woman with an advanced degree who, with her husband, decided to move back to Maine from California to be closer to his family as they raised their two children. They bought a nice historic brick house in the downtown and they really hope that the city will install a pocket park, not a parking lot in a little unused corner that we have that's along Water Street that we've been talking about because they wanna be able to go downtown and shop and take their kids and be able to meet other people with kids and sit and have a coffee in the park while their children are playing without worrying about the kids running off into the street, 15,000 traffic count. Consider the benefit from shifting the conversation away from the spokes, those thousands of miles of state roads that cost too much, move too fast, and these days are getting less use, and back to the hubs, the reason that we're here in the first place, the hubs that they run through. Consider the benefit of redesigning our transportation networks to address equity issues, for those who live in a car-based world, but don't have, or don't want, 
or can't safely drive or just can't afford a car. And with a shift in how we use what are called highway funds from what is called the Department of Transportation toward projects that support safe and dare I say, pleasant bike ped accessibility to commerce and recreation, we can revitalize and reinvigorate our local neighborhoods and our local economies using the same spirit and values that built them in the first place and connect them to each other and the rest of the world through the internet and with a much more lean and more affordable network of highways. That spoke network of roads is still going to be important, but we can look at how we invest money differently. And by doing so, we can develop those hubs while leaving our open spaces intact and making our local commuter experience safer and more person oriented rather than automobile oriented. If we consider the governor's broadband initiative proposals as building a new and much cheaper commuter line for our knowledge workers, we can attract the types of new business sectors and small business entrepreneurship that we want to claim to grow in Maine. And I see housing and jobs and transportation and food systems as being totally completely interrelated systems thinking questions, especially in our local hub communities. And so my question to you, and I hope we have a great conversation, is can we reimagine a 21st century Maine that uses our modern travel ways to stabilize our state and local economies and restore the places we value using the same Maine values and uh, uh, ingenuity that built them in the first place. And I apologize for going long. I don't know that you were that long, Nate. Uh, it was fascinating. Um, great presentation, great points. Thank you so much. I did wanna um, you know, talk a little bit about the next steps and then open up the conversation um, to the participants who are attending here today. Um, with respect to the next steps, especially for the legislators uh, uh, in the group today, um, I, I hope that we have successfully um, established the urgency and importance of uh, walkability and bikeability as issues for Maine to take up and support. Um, the Bicycle Coalition is hoping to create what we're calling a bike ped trail caucus. Um, I know that uh, uh, Representative Bell is here and I, I saw he, he offered a chat about some of the work that he's doing on multi-use trails. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're calling this group the, the, the Bike Ped Trail Caucus, because we want to just keep a focus on the ways in which improving walkability, bikeability, and, and convenient access for health, transportation, recreation, you know, all of the things that our speakers have spoken about, um, you know, can, can be achieved. Um, our hope with this caucus group is to uh, enable um, communications around pending legislation that you know, intersects with walkability, bikeability, and uh, trail access issues. Um, we don't want to spam you in any way, but we want to make sure that you know, you're informed about uh, the ways in which some of the bills in the legislature um, might impact these issues. And so we're going to urge you to uh, share some contact information with us so that we can um, either text you or email you when uh, opportunities to intervene on important legislation in this area come up. We'll be sending out a link to the legislators after today's session so that they can sign up for updates on bills that impact the issues that we discussed today. Um, I'd like to give another just huge thank you to uh, Dr. Lord Parham, Dr. Becca Bolos, and Mr. Nate Rudy for their time and expertise. I thought the presentations were fascinating uh, and, and very interesting. We would like to, uh, at this time, uh, entertain uh, questions from the attendees. And if you would use the raise hand feature that Zoom offers in the participant window, um, we can um, do this in a somewhat order orderly fashion. We're at 12.40 now, so we, you know, we're, we're trying to be done for the legislators by 12.45, but uh, if you want to hang around and um, continue the conversation. Uh, I know that uh, the BCM team is available until 1 p.m. Um, so uh, that all said, if there's anyone who would like to um, uh, ask a, a question or make a comment, um, please raise your hand and we'll, uh, we'll get you up there. And I'm going to have to ask my team to help me uh, monitor to see who is, uh, I see Sydney, uh, Sydney Duck, uh, and 
we're going. You are you are open and able to speak, uh, Sydney. Um, I think I think I should share an experience, which then will lead lead itself to a question. Um, back back in June of last year, um, I was run over by a truck in downtown Brunswick, and the injuries I sustained included uh, multiple fractures of my pelvis and a number of other injuries. And the result of that was that the, the driver was cited for what the accident report cited that the driver had ignored uh, my right away and it ignored the three foot law. And at the end of that, she was not ticketed. So as, as I'm listening to these various speakers talk about the, the economic benefits of, of, of how we structure downtowns and Brunswick versus Gray or versus Hollowell is very different. As I, as I listen to the economic emphasis there, I don't get any sense that there's been any inclusion of how, how do we educate um, law enforcement? How, how do we educate drivers? How do we structure a town like Brunswick where if you try to drive, ride your bike down Brunswick, you're taking your life in your hand under the best of circumstances, just the way the parking's developed. And um, if there is no, if there's no uh, recourse for drivers being irresponsible, what's the point of the rest of it? Thank you for your question. Um, and while our, our respondents are thinking about how to answer that, I'm gonna take the opportunity to call out a piece of um, legislation that we're currently tracking, um, which really highlights the importance of this group. Um, uh, a bill uh, has been submitted that the Bicycle Coalition of Maine uh, is supporting and involved with that would require that any bicycle or pedestrian crash that involves a motor vehicle, obviously, um, be referred to the DA for consideration of possible charges. Because what we've been noticing is that, you know, your, your story is not sadly unique. There are many situations in which um, you know, drivers are, are injuring and killing uh, people walking and bicycling, and they, they walk away from it without any, uh, any, you know, repercussions at all, you know, except for, you know, maybe a civil suit. But there are no citations, there's no tickets, there's no fines. Um, we're trying to make it a little bit easier for law enforcement to, um, you know, just submit the report, have the district attorney review it, and, um, and issue charges at that level. Uh, something similar to, uh, to this happened actually in um, Lincoln County recently where um, a bicycle was hit, injured, um, you know, fairly seriously, but not, not, not you know, traumatically, not too bad. Um, the sheriff declined to issue a ticket. Uh, the DA was consulted with and brought into the conversation and eventually the DA uh, directed the sheriff to issue a ticket, the sheriff declined, and the DA then had to go to the court and actually take care of that, um, you know, at that level. So we do see this as a huge problem, and the Bicycle Coalition of Maine is certainly trying to, uh, um, you know, step up enforcement. Um, so that's my piece on this. Nate, Lori, or Becca, do you want to add anything to that? I agree that there's a awareness and training component to to all of this and that it's one thing to say you have a three foot buffer and it's another thing to enforce it um I, I mean i hear you and i'm so sorry to hear about your injury i uh i'll also refer back to a couple years three years ago a young person was killed in a crosswalk in lewiston on a Plourd highway and that was a terrible piece of news and there were some uh press uh some commentaries to the paper written after that and I have unfortunately haven't heard any new discussions since that young person died. Uh, we have a question. I saw Dan Emery actually raised his actual hand. So we'll go to Dan and then to Lauren Arford. And I do want to make a note that if any of the legislators participating would like to make a comment, um, please uh, raise your hand as well. We'd love to get uh, your voice in this. Uh, Dan, you're up if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question. Took me, took me a minute to uh, unmute. Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, probably more of a comment. I think in addition to all uh, the other benefits of uh, facilitating uh, cycling and, and walking that you've mentioned, 
I mean, I think a lot about the environmental climate change aspect of it, uh, because obviously the, to me, the easiest way to reduce emissions and, uh, is to ride a bike instead of uh, drive a car. And um, yeah, I live in North Yarmouth and work in Yarmouth. So I, and, I, and when, when the roads aren't icy, I do most of my commuting and errands and grocery shopping on a bike. And I could easily be, you know, driving a car and uh, I have an electric car now, so I'm not emitting, but still that electricity has to be generated. Uh, so I think that's a pretty good selling point for all of this, uh, in addition to health and economics and uh, uh, mental health and <laughs> all, all the benefits of cycling and riding. Thank you for the comment. Um, Lauren, I'm going to call on you. And then uh, Art Bell is um, got his hand up, and I'd love to hear from Art. Uh, Lauren, if you'd like to make your comment or ask a question. So the first thing is that uh, I am here representing uh, Poppy Arford, who is a state rep for this district. Uh, I have a great deal of sympathy for the bikers, walkers. Uh, Brunswick is not a friendly place. The message for uh, Mr. Duck, I believe it was, um, I would contact uh, the town councilor, Kathy Wilson. She's on the uh, bike ped committee here in Brunswick and uh, make suggestions known. We do need as much information as we can to improve the situation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, Art, I'm going to let you speak, and then I see Sandra Hodge has her hand up, so we'll go to you after, Sandra. Thanks, Jim. This is uh, Art Bell. I'm a freshman legislator uh, from here in Yarmouth, uh, House District 47. And uh, But more importantly, I am an avid bicyclist, longtime member of the Bike Coalition, and, um, and uh, my wife and I have become um, really um, uh, smitten with uh, biking rail trails all around the country. We, we, we're part of that uh, demographic that can uh, pile our bikes in the car and drive somewhere and then uh, unload them and, and go biking for a week. So um, in Maine, there already is existing, you know, a whole bunch of uh, um, uh, bike trails that are just wonderful uh, recreational opportunities. Um, the, the, the one that uh, in the Portland area that everyone knows is the, uh, the Eastern Trail. Um, but we're hoping to, uh, to add to that uh, inventory of trails with um, um, uh, the, the trail, you know, living in Yarmouth, the one that it just I can't not mention is the, is the uh, Atlantic and St. Lawrence line that runs parallel to uh, 295 all the way from Portland right up here to Yarmouth. And then it kind of takes a left-hand turn and goes all the way to Lewis and Auburn. So, um, and there are other bunch of trails uh, that, that we're working on, uh, the Merry Meeting Trail and the, uh, the Sunrise Trail up, in, uh, up uh, in Ellsworth, and trying to network these all together so that we have a, a really robust uh, network of trails here in, in Maine that will attract people from all over the country to come here and bicycle and, and be wonderful for, for those of us who like to bike uh, you know, off-road, if you will. Um, so. Um, I, I invite you, I put the link to my, my bill, my uh, piece of legislation in the uh, chat, and I hope that um, I can get some support. Thank, Thank you, Bart. And, uh, and uh, I do know that there's at least one other bill that um, you know, is, is, is seeking to do the same thing, to figure out ways to open up um, unused rail corridors and convert them into multi-use trails. This is something the Bicycle Coalition is very supportive of, and um, we look forward to tracking your bill and supporting it as it moves along. Um, Sandra Hodge had her hand up, so I'm gonna call Sandra, and then Poppy Arford has joined us uh, in person, and so we'll, uh, we'll go to her next. So Sandra, what's your question or comment? You're, you're muted, Sandra, you'll need to unmute. I just wanted to say that I'm a member of the Bike Pedestrian and by the Bicycling and Pedestrian Council in Brunswick. So if anyone has any concerns that they would like to put forward, I'm more than happy to speak with them uh, at any time. So thank you. Thank you, Sandra. 
Uh, Poppy Arford, I'm going to turn it over to you. And then I see Christine Keeney from the East Coast Greenway is her hand up. So we'll go to her after Poppy. Yeah, I, I'm, I apologize for not being here for all the meeting. I had competing meetings, so I very much apologize. I'm a huge fan of this group and I definitely want to be part of it. Our, I've already talked with Representative Bell. I think he knows he has my full support for his bill, which is an excellent piece of legislation. Thank you so much, Art, for doing that. And then what I want to say is I'm, I'm really concerned about what any story I hear about a pedestrian on a, on a pedestrian or a bike rider or anybody who is trying to move in a non-motorized manner, and especially in our town and in our community. And there also was... Uh, a friend of mine who was literally, I mean, you can't basically mowed down by a vehicle while she was running about a month and a half ago. And, um, you know, she survived, but I mean, almost every bone in her body was broken. And I think, you know, I'm really, I don't know, and I'm just going to put this out there for people to think about, you know, I think so many people are using their cell phones in their vehicles and it's so distracting. And, um, we'll never know for sure, at least I'll never know for sure whether this particular situation was had anything to do with a cell phone, but it was, you know, on outer church road in the middle of nowhere, you know, in broad daylight. And how can something like that happen if you're not distracted? And so I'm really interested in working with anybody. I know we have a law in the books about you can't use a cell phone, but I don't know how much investigation actually happens once a, someone on a bike has been hit or someone walking has been hit to determine whether or not a cell phone was involved in that. And um, I think we need to do that. I'm really concerned that as you know, we become more and more of a virtual world and people are just so connected to their screens, it's really hard for people to put their screen down when they get in their car and their screen happens to be on their cell phone. So if anybody else is interested in that, I, I think it'd be great for us to look more into that. Thank you very much for that comment. Um, I, I, I was speaking um, with one of our board members recently, and one of the things that we're trying to figure out is uh, how much you know, police are enforcing the handheld ban. And um, the coalition has asked the Violations Bureau a few times for data on um, citations issued on uh, you know, the handheld ban, distracted driving, um, speeding even. And we've kind of hit a, a brick wall, so it might be um, it might be useful for you, Poppy, or one of the other legislators involved with the caucus to um, help us make that outreach because we think they'll listen to you uh, more than they'll listen to us. Um, that said, uh, Christine, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, we have a a little bit more time. If uh, anyone else would like to uh, offer a question or comment, uh, put your hand up, and I'll get to you. But Christine, floor is yours. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I'll just be really quick. I just wanted to highlight another bill um, <clears throat> that's important for the conversation, which um, there's a, a general lack of funding um, in, for bike ped um, facilities as well as trails. Um, the only funding that we really have that's dedicated is um, federal funding that comes from the Transportation Alternatives and the Recreational Trails Program. Um, the, that federal funding is administered um, through the Maine Department of Transportation. Um, and there's some additional funding that comes from the feds for those programs that we could realize um, for these types of projects that we're talking about in Maine, if um, some prioritization um, of the obligation limits to those programs um, were adjusted at DOT. So I just wanted to put in the chat um, another bill that we're working on with the representative Grohowski from Ellsworth as the sponsor um, to ensure adequate funding through the transportation alternatives and recreational trails programs um, for bike ped and trail projects in Maine. And thanks, Jim. Great, Christine. You know that's that's uh, one of one of the points that we raise every time we talk to the main DOT. Uh, I know that um, the bike ped program did get a little bump this year, but it's still you know a, 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 a tiny amount compared to the cost of um, you know any given bridge project. I mean, uh, I think uh, Patrick got another two hundred and fifty thousand or something like that. Um, Sydney, I see your hand is up again. Um, it's a it's a it's a quick one. Okay, go ahead. I, I, we moved here uh, five years ago from California, much in line with what one of the other people was talking about. <clears throat> and I've been writing since I've been here. I did a lot of writing in California. What I've noticed, and I don't know whether it's, it's reflected in the way the police think about bike ped accidents, 
is there doesn't seem to, even the drivers around here are far more aggressive than they were in California. So I don't know whether it's an educational, a broad educational goal that we need to be perceive, pursuing, but it's very different here than it was in California. Well, that's 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 not encouraging to hear, um, but thank you for that uh, feedback. And that certainly uh, throws down a gauntlet that we'll have to take up and, and address. Um, you know, I've been a happy participant, haven't I? <laughs> coalition, you know, for those of you who don't know, the coalition is currently um, running uh, a slow me down campaign, slow main down campaign. Uh, and um, this is intended to actually make some changes to the attitudes um, uh, to drive, you know, the drivers hold when they're when they're operating um, and, and get them to voluntarily comply with speed limits and, and slow down and realize that the people who are out on the roads walking or bicycling are their neighbors and deserve respect and uh, speed limits, um, you know, exist for good reasons. Uh, and especially in residential areas, people should be always driving at or below the speed limit. Please visit our website, www.bikemain.org, and you'll see uh, fast links to the Slow Me Down campaign. Uh, it has an opportunity for you to sign on. You get stickers, you can get lawn signs, and most importantly, you uh, get your voice included in communications that we'll be having with municipalities and the DOT. Um, Nate, I see your hand is up, please. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add to that, <clears throat> the, the slow me down campaign that the only thing that I'm aware of as a sort of a armchair planner type dude that actually works on that is narrowing the lanes of traffic. If you have a 14 foot wide travel lane and a 25 mile an hour sign on it, it looks like a racetrack. People are going to treat it like a racetrack. And where I grew up, um, we had a different built environment but I was the king of my neighborhood. Like I rode my bike everywhere, six miles this way, 12 miles that way. You know, we, and when there was a pack of us, we just owned the whole place. I don't see that here. I just don't see kids riding their bikes that way uh, anywhere that I've lived or worked in Maine. And I, I wonder about that. And I hope there are things we can do to make it feel more safe for them and for everyone else who commutes with a bicycle or walks for that matter. Thank you for that comment. I think you know you know me well enough to know that that's a big one for the Bicycle Coalition of Maine. We're actively working, and uh, you know, it, thank you to Lori Parham. The AARP has been a huge partner in efforts to calm traffic, and uh, we're we're doing what we can to to push towards um, narrower lanes in uh, in contexts that are going to be um, you know expecting people walking and biking. So more on that to come. But uh, you know, thanks for that comment, Nate. Uh, anyone else? We are at uh, 12.59. Oh, we have Eloise. Uh, we'll, we'll go to you as the, uh, the final comment of the session. And before I close it out, uh, please go ahead. Awesome. Um, thanks, Jim. I, I lived in Maine. I actually moved two years ago to go on a bike trip. So I love biking and I'm hoping to move back to Portland next year. Um, I just wanted to comment that I think bike lanes, bike paths, sidewalks are awesome. Um, however, I felt a lot of danger in the winter months in Portland, especially um, when snow plows created, you know, entire snow banks in the bike lane, sidewalks were never plowed, um, became very, very icy. So I think along with legislator and tactics for increasing, um, you know, miles of accessible pathways, it would also be advantageous to ensure that they're actually accessible especially when the winter lasts, you know, sometimes seven full months. Um, and I'm not sure if anyone has read any books about this, but I found I can uh, post a YouTube video I found that is really informative. And in Norway, they tried switching up the order of plowing um, and you can see what they found. It didn't work the first year, but it worked the second year. So that was just my comment. It's a great comment, and it is a it is literally a perennial issue in Maine uh, that um, you know come winter the sidewalks uh, uh, even if they're getting attended to are are hard to keep up with and make uh, safely walkable. Um, so um, great comment, and uh, you know it, it is an opportunity for local advocacy for sure, and we're helping uh, some communities coordinate efforts to keep sidewalks clear, um, keep them sanded, keep them safe. Um, but a, a great comment. So with that, uh, we are at 101. I'm going to uh, 
close the session and um, thank our participants, uh, Nate Rudy, uh, Becca Bolas, and Lori Parham. Thank you so much for your expertise and your comments and your presentations. That was all great. Thank you for those of you who provided comments and questions to the group. Um, the legislators, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we will be following up with a link to um, the sign on for the, um, the Bike Ped Trail Caucus so we can keep you informed about bills like Arts Bill, um, like the DA uh, referral bill and others that are out there that we're paying attention to. Uh, thank you so much for your um, attendance today. Uh, be safe out there and have a great rest of your day and a fine weekend. Bye-bye.